loving God, the songs that we sang that speak of your power and your love and what you can do, may you work in each one of us today, your power. May that place of maybe greatest challenge, that, that place of darkness that is looming before us, whatever it might be, May you burst forth the tomb. May you bring light. May you bring hope. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to be seated. So, my family's going to laugh about this illustration, but um, for a number of years, we... Uh, we've talked about putting in an in-ground pool. And then COVID hit, and we started talking a lot more about it. And um, last summer, we, um, we decided that we would paint our house, and it would be a little bit of a test run uh, on a number of levels. One, it would save us money so that, well, if we wanted to go for a pool, there'd be a little bit more money. But but a big part, we, we told the kids about this, I have three teenagers, uh, the only way we can afford to do a pool is if we do a lot of the work ourselves. And so, you know, this is going to give us the opportunity of doing a major project together. Okay, it was a little shaky. Because <laughs> um, when it got down to it, it was mostly Cindy and I out doing the heavy lifting. And, and then the kids were like, no, 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 but, but it'll be different when it's a pool. I mean, you know, I mean, this was just painting a house. That doesn't make much sense. But, but a pool, that will be different. So we finished the house in September. And we started praying and planning and drawing out how and what and how much. And, and then we took it to the next level. We, we, we really got, like, detailed lists of what the project would look like and then and then we started getting bids for the two, the two parts we weren't going to do, excavating and, um, elect, and the, electri the electrical. We need, a, we need a license to get it bonded. So, okay, so, so I, got, I got three bids for each one's come out. We, in small Christmas, don't plan any trips for the next couple of years. We're getting a pool. In January, we ordered the pool. And then sometime in late January, after we had ordered the pool, after we'd done all this planning and preparing, one of my kids looked at me and said, are we really going to do this? I mean, you guys have been talking about this for years, but is this really going to happen? And, and th this, this was where our kids were at. Their hope for the future of a pool was really dim. I mean, this... Uh, e How's your hope right now? Especially for your future and for our world. When I was a boy, I grew up with this vision of what was called the American dream. I believe that we lived in the greatest country and the greatest civilization the world had ever seen. That every generation was successfully getting better and advancing and improving. We had some threats, but we'd gone to the moon. We, we had unlocked the secrets of atomic energy. And it was America that won the two world wars. I mean, we were the land of the free, the home of the brave. I mean, okay. In 2006, the Pew Research Group conducted a survey and, a, and asked a question that they had been asking for decades. What do you believe about the future of our world and, our, and, and then the future for our kids? And in 2006, for the first time, 50% of Americans believed that the future was going to be worse for their kids than for them. And in the last 15 years, that has only grown. We look out at the world today, 
We see polarization, fragmentation of society, widespread discontent, depression, drug abuse, addiction, loneliness. And the state, I mean, everything's getting politicized and, and, and then politics, it's so divided. I mean, this pandemic was an opportunity for us as Americans to rally together, find unity, here's a big cause, and instead, it has only deepened the divide. There is a profound loss of social trust. And there is fear. So much fear. And I don't know about you, but I feel it. My, my oldest goes off to college um, this fall. And, you know, it just, it, it feels different than when I went off. I mean, I, when I went off to school, I was so excited. I was so, and, but, and, I, and, and I've cherished this opportunity for my kids to be launching off. But in the midst of all that we're going through and everything as we've been preparing, you know, there's been this, I, I'm concerned for my daughter's physical safety. You know, and it's, as she's considering going to schools where, you know, they're, they're major cities, and we look out and, you know, we've had violence and rioting and anarchy in Seattle and Portland. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't feel good about my daughter going there. And then, you know, I, I, I love learning. Universities are beginning to look more like indoctrination camps instead of places where you go to learn how to think. But, you know, we live in an information age and people need degrees and all these things and what are you going to do? And, and I could go on, right? I mean, there's so many things that we could talk about that, that are all over the news all the time. But we are living in an age of anxiety and I think, for many, hope is dim about the future of this world. But I want to put forward to you, I have hope. I have absolute conviction that there is a bright future for my kids and, God willing, their kids. But it isn't a hope that comes from this world. It's the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. I believe that there is a creator God who made this universe and he made it good and he made it with a plan and a purpose and he, and he formed us as his image bearers and he calls us to life and even though sin and death entered into this good creation, he will not let go of it. He is at work in it and he ultimately, he sent his son and his son died and Jesus died on the cross for our sins and he was raised to new life and he ascended into heaven and he sits on the throne and he is coming back someday and no matter what we see in the world right now, everything, we have a bright and glorious future in Jesus Christ. Christ. And it is a better hope than anything this world can offer. It's not wishful thinking. I want to argue for you today. I want to present that this hope that we have is more reliable, more reasonable, more realistic, and more powerful than the American dream or any story of the inevitable progress of humanity or Western civilization. Why? Because it is built on the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. I want to unpack this prayer that we prayed at the beginning of the service. This is a prayer that Paul prayed at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 1. Let me, let me share again these words to you. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you are called, to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The first thing Paul says in this prayer is he wants our hearts, our wills, 
to be shaped by Christian hope. And then he gives a very specific, concrete picture of what this hope looks like. It is God's resurrection power for us. Let your hearts, let your minds be shaped by this truth. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is right now at work in you if you believe in Jesus Christ. This power has a future element. And this future element is given to sustain us and give us courage and strength. Do not be afraid of the future. And do not be afraid of death. Oh, we may die, but we won't really die because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us and death has been defeated and we ourselves will be part of that resurrection. This power has a past element. Paul will write in just a little bit in Ephesians 2.6, God raised us up. And the raised is past tense. He's already done it. He raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And what this means is that you and I do not relate to God out of our past failures or out of our present shortcomings or over any future mistakes that we may do. But we always stand in relation to God and the fact that we've already been raised with Christ and we are now seated in Christ before God. It means that we always have access. His presence, his power, it's always there for us. And finally, this resurrection power has a present reality. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is with us and for us today. We're not merely waiting to die so that we can go to heaven. We get to live a new life now with Jesus Christ. Jesus came to give us more and better life, and the power that raised him from the dead is available to us. So today, we should expect his power to help us overcome any addictions in our lives. Today, we should expect God resources to battle against any despair, any depression, any darkness, Today, God wants to fortify our hearts and our minds to give us courage so that we will always choose the way of love, no matter what hardship, no matter what danger. He wants to release you and me to start dreaming God-sized dreams. Faithfulness to Jesus isn't holding down the fort or avoiding mistakes. Don't want to get in trouble. It's storming the gates of hell. It's crashing and, and willing to crash some alabaster jars that may seem priceless to this world. But you know what? Jesus calls me, so I'm going to do it. The resurrection power of Jesus is the content of Christian hope. One of the reasons that Jesus so rapidly gained followers in the early church period was because of the hope he was able to give people. It was a hope that could face the harshest circumstances of a corrupt, despotic government that had all power. It was hope that helped them get through brutal pandemics that happened numerous times throughout early church history that wiped out villages and towns Not only that, but they had to deal with famine and drought on a regular basis. And then there were wars, always crushing wars. And Jesus instilled in his followers a hope that could deal with all of that stuff in such a way that when other people saw the way that they lived in the midst of how hard and brutal this world is, they went, we want what you have. Who is this Jesus? How can you live the way that you live? The biblical word that gets translated into English as hope is elpida. It means profound certainty. A strong conviction that determines your steps and your life. It isn't expressing mere preference or desire. It isn't wishful thinking. I hope that I get apple pie today. 
It is a strong conviction that shapes the way that you live. So let me give you a picture of Elpida. So one of my kids said, are we really getting a pool? I mean, is this really going to happen? And at that point, they were not expressing anything close to Elpida. <laughs> there was no strong conviction. But about four weeks ago, there came a decisive day. The excavators came, and they dug the hole. And when that hole was there, suddenly that hole did something where it was like, wait a second, this is really happening. I mean, wow, you mean we're going to do it. I mean, and, and there suddenly was a shift where this wasn't dim hope, but this was like, okay, it's real. It's going to happen. Now, we still don't have a pool. There's still a lot of hard work to do to get the pool. But we have a hole, and it needs to be filled. Now, the commitment of building a pool is nothing compared to the commitment of following Jesus Christ. But for a little while, that hole is shaping our lives. Um, I start my vacation tomorrow. And, and we're just going to work. You know, I, I, somebody asked me, you know, you, so you're going to go on vacation. You're going to rest? No, it's a working vacation. But it's going to be a good working vacation. We're going to be working on that pool, sun up to sun down. And as, as long as our bodies hold out. You know, I, I, I did turn 50 this year. And, um, you know, that, that was one of those question marks about this project. But, but we are living towards that future. It determines a little bit of our time. It determines our energy. It determines the money that we're spending. All of these things about how we live are getting shaped by that reality. Now, you could say that we have hope that a pool's going to be there this summer. But I think at this point, we would all tell you that that sounds like too weak of a word. Yes, we're going to have a pool this summer. Now, it's possible that something could get in the way. But it's really, really unlikely that, that it, whatever happens is really going to get in the way. It just is going to make it more challenging. That expectation, that sense of conviction, that sense that there's going to be this day after all this hard labor where I'm going to sit in the pool and I'm going to say, kids, where's my nachos? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's headed there. And what I want to put forward to you is that is Elpida. That's the biblical idea of hope that we're talking about. That's the kind of hope that Jesus wants us to live into. That's the kind of hope that Paul is praying for in this Ephesians passage. Now, how do we grow up into that kind of hope? Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. Sorry, the pun. The whole wasn't what gave my kids confidence that the pool was coming. The confidence came from knowing the ones who caused the hole to be dug. My kids knew at that moment that there was no possible way that their parents were going to let that hole just sit there. I mean, we have this pile of dirt, and we apologize for the dust storm that went over the Tri-Cities last week. That was our problem because we have all of this dirt that just got blown every... I mean, we were out there hosing it down, but I mean, ugh! 2,000 years ago, three holes were dug in the ground, and they got filled with three crosses. From the outside, people thought the, Rome, the Romans and the Jewish leaders won, and Jesus has lost. But Jesus claimed something different was going on. He told his closest disciples plainly on three different occasions before it ever happened, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed, but then on the third day, be raised to life. In the midst of his trial, he said, Nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down 
of my own accord, only to take it back up again. This was God's all-in moment. Jesus loved us to the utmost. He gave and he gave and he finally gave his life. But there was another hole, a tomb that could not contain the corpse, a grave that could not hold back his life. Jesus was raised according to the scriptures. This was God's plan from the beginning. 700 years before Jesus' death, the prophet Isaiah spoke these words. This comes from Isaiah 53. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. And this is altogether crucial. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. And after he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And the Jewish people kind of had no idea what this was all going to look like and how this was related to the Messiah or anything. But Jesus understood he got it, and this is what Jesus did. And this was God's plan. Our confidence is in the God who has done this for us. The God who came into this world to save us, who suffered and died, who was raised from the dead, who now sits at the right hand of God. We can know and trust. He's got a better plan than anybody. He is able to do it. He's already done the most difficult part of the work. Death has been defeated. He's secured eternity for us. And I want to put forward to you that this, what he's done, the foundation of Christian hope, it is a better hope, more reliable, realistic, reasonable, powerful, than any hope that we can find in this world. Indeed, he is the only hope of the world. God dug a hole. He planted a stake in it. The world can try to deny and the world can try to ignore. But the light that breaks forth from the cross and the empty tomb cannot be hidden. How does this Alpida conviction that all of this is real and that God is for us and his power is available to us, how does it grow in us? Well, it begins with us becoming convinced that this is real, that it's reliable, that he's reliable, that, that this hope is where we invest because it's realistic, because it's powerful. Jesus is reliable as the empty tomb. Let me unpack that for you. Christian hope takes its stand on the fact that the tomb of Jesus Christ was empty. It is, it, on one level, it's almost miraculous that we have all of the information that we have about this Jewish Messiah from the, the first century of what we call the first century during this Roman era. I mean, this is uh, that we have all the information, not just from the Bible, but we have all these extra biblical historians that speak about Jesus and the Jesus movement and that we know the details of his death. Now, we have been given all of this as a firm foundation on which to build our lives. Now, we can know things of history. 
Now, it's different than science. So, you know, like, we believe that the American, um, the Declaration of Independence was written in 1776 and signed. Now, we, we have good historical evidence. You could go to Washington, D.C. You could see the document. You could see where they wrote those numbers. Historical knowledge is different than laboratory knowledge. I, we, we know it, but we don't know it in the same way that we can go into a laboratory and we can do an experiment and we can see that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But unless you want to live in denial of all of history, all of us, probably all of us, believe that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. Well, if we're going to believe anything out of the ancient world, then we have really strong evidence to believe that Jesus lived, that he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and then he was buried in a tomb, and three days later that tomb was empty. And not only do we have this evidence of the empty tomb, but we have the reaction to it that needs to be part of the explanation. How did the Jewish idea of resurrection get transformed? How did all of these Jews begin worshiping Jesus as God? How did this movement, begin, which began by making this claim that Jesus rose from the dead, how did it get started? And then how did it so rapidly increase? And then how is somebody like the Apostle Paul, who started out as an opponent, who was killing, other Christian, who was killing Christians because of their faith, ultimately say that he saw the risen Lord Jesus? And then what happens is that in 1 Corinthians 15, he writes about this testimony, and he sits there and he says that more than 500 people witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. This wasn't a one-time event, but over 40 days, 10 different times, people saw Jesus back from the dead. And understand this. This is the way that Christians have always declared our faith. The reason that we believe in Jesus is because we believe that he was raised from the dead. That's where our faith takes its stand. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14 and 15. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. N.T. Wright, one of our best biblical scholars today, says, No other explanation has been offered in 2,000 years of sneering skepticism that can satisfactorily account for the empty tomb of how it became empty, how the disciples came to see Jesus, how their lives and worldviews were transformed. The claim that Jesus was raised from the dead is not wishful thinking. It's not about fine-sounding arguments or empty promises. The hole was empty. Jesus is alive. He has already defeated death. He wants to save us. That reality is what we take our stand on and why we believe he's reliable. Jesus believing in Jesus is also more reasonable than any other hope. We live in this physical universe, and the biblical story is God created it good, and it's very good, and he created us as human beings, and we are unique, we're image bearers, we're embodied spiritual beings. Sin came into the world, death came into the world, but God refused to let that go. And he, be and he began a process of not letting go his good creation or us. Now, the religions of the world, all the major religions, they put forward some sort of a spiritual salvation. In some sense, they're different, but, but they're all kind of pointing in this direction. They teach that matter is really unimportant. In the end, all that is going to really exist is spirit. And whatever direction you go, you know, you'll end up just being spiritual. That's one type of hope, but it loses the world. Secularism comes at us with another type of hope. There is no spirit. Everything's just materialistic. 
Secularism offers progress, but I would argue that it offers progress without real hope. Death is inevitable. This universe is going to flame out. Let's make believe that our lives really matter, but it all ends in death, oblivion. Jesus offers something categorically different from a, just a spiritual ending or just a physical ending. The resurrection of Jesus is called Ereborn, a powerful down payment, an aparche, a first fruits of a future physical resurrection in which this material world will be renewed. All the wrongs will be righted. Things will become true and good and beautiful and absolutely perfect. Every tear will be wiped away. Death and the devil will be banished forever. And the world will be mended and liberated. And you and I will live forever, not as angels floating around as spirits, but as embodied spiritual beings in bodies that are incorruptible. It is the, it is the ending that makes the most sense of our experience. Why do we not want to die? Because we weren't made for death. Why do we enjoy food and life and dancing and movement? Because we're human beings. And it is a part of our destiny. But most of all, it's about God. And I want to put forward to you that the hope that Jesus gives us is the most realistic. Every other hope is built on some sort of human agent. But Christian hope is built on the faithfulness and power of God. To err is human. At some point, I'll disappoint you. I don't want to, but I'm weak. I can't help it. I do. Christian hope is not ultimately putting our hope in a human agent to sustain our life. But it is hoping in the God who raised Jesus from the dead. This God who's proven himself to be good and powerful and loving and gracious and kind. He brings light into our darkness. He loves you. He knows you. And he wants you to be with him. Timothy Keller writes, Christian hope means that I stop betting my life and happiness on human agency. Instead, I rest in him. I'm absolutely convinced because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the love demonstrated in the cross, because Jesus was raised from the dead, that God wants to give you a hope to build your life on that will scatter the darkness, that will overcome the despair, that will give you strength and courage to live according to truth and goodness. He wants to give you a confidence that comes that you are known and you have a future and it is secure. But when Paul prayed this prayer for us to know this hope, he wasn't praying for us to be able to give the right answer on a, on a test or to regurgitate a formula. He wanted us to experience the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to be at work in us. It begins by convincing our minds and our hearts that he really is for us and with us and he's made promises and so we're going to live towards the future that he promises us. But at some point, we have to take the step of not just listening to the idea but allowing that future to shape the way that we live today. This is my call to you. This is the call that I think Jesus makes to all of us. If you want to experience that hope, you got to go all in. The complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ isn't radical. It's normal. It's what we Christians are called to do. This hope is supposed to change the way that we live. Every aspect, our time, our money, our commitments, our priorities. In Luke 9, 23 and 24, Jesus threw down the gauntlet with his disciples. It's time to get real. And he just said it straight out. 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever is willing to lose their life for me will save it. Why did he say pick up the cross? Because he wants to release his resurrection power in us. The disciples took it literally. The least we can do is take it figuratively. The call is complete surrender. Our lives and anything less than surrendering all that we are is really robbing God of the glory that he's due. It's also cheating ourselves because God wants to bless us and he wants to give us hope. But the way that you're going to know that hope and feel that hope is if you begin actually living your life based upon his promises, allowing the future that he says is ours to be what we walk towards. Now, does it sound a little hard and scary? I mean, I like veto power. I like being in control. This is why Paul's praying. This doesn't come naturally to us. This is something that is supernatural. We need God's help to lay down this control that we've held and now say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be Lord of all. Because if Jesus isn't Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. In Romans 8, Paul writes about the challenges and hardships that we face in this life. But then he points with confidence to a bright future that God promises us and a plan that includes not just us, but the entire cosmos. And then in verses 24 and 25, he says this, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We have a bright and glorious future, but we're not experiencing it all right now. Right now, in this world, you'll have trouble. But I'll tell you that the word there that gets translated patiently, that translation's pretty weak. The idea is endure. You know, it's like the, the marathon runner that hits the wall at 20 miles, but wants to finish the race. And though they want to quit, they keep running. Or it's like the person who knows that they're keeping watch and guard over the city at night and it's bitter cold and the wind is howling and the snows are hitting them in the face and all they want to do is go inside but they endure for the sake of everyone else. When he says to wait patiently, he's saying endure like that. It won't be comfortable. It won't be easy. It won't feel easy. We're going to have to endure difficult times. It includes what we're going through, pandemics, the rising sense of social stigmatism for even being a Christian. But we endure because we believe in that future. And so we go all in. We refuse to give up. No matter how many times you get knocked down, get back up. Is there something that you've given up on recently? Maybe you need to go back and give it another try. Because failure is not the enemy of success. It is success's closest ally. Following Jesus isn't easy. We can expect to stumble and to fall because learning to keep in step with him. My feet trip. I'm not very good at it. I fall, I pray, I get back up, I keep going. That's living by Christian hope. A few months ago, uh, a person came in and uh, met with me. And they'd been doing Bible study with me and they, they shared. They said, you know, you've been talking about trusting Jesus with every aspect of your life and I was listening to talk about some of these things and, and I realized that there was an area in my life where 
I, I really hadn't turned it over to Jesus. Um, I, didn't, I don't have enough money to get through the month, and when I don't have enough money, I just put the rest of it on a credit card, and I charge it, and my credit card bills are climbing. And, um, and, I, and I thought that I was trusting, but I really wasn't trusting Jesus. I was just trusting in this credit card. So I'm going to put the credit card aside. I'm, I'm, I'm not using them anymore. I don't know how I'm going to pay for everything, but, but I feel like this is what Jesus is calling me to do. And this was one of those all-in sorts of moments. I mean, okay, you're stepping out there. You're going for it. The person has experienced God's provisions. It, it amazes them. It, it, now, a few weeks ago, they came to me, and they're like, I only have $50 in my checking account, and I've got these big bills coming up, and I don't know how this is all going to work out. God's already provided in the past, and everything's been taken care of, and, 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 it's, but, and we prayed, and we prayed some more, and we talked a little bit. And they had thousands of dollars of bill coming due that month. And then the person came back and said, in a few short days, God gave me more than all that I needed to pay for all my bills. And he had to work in some people's hearts and do some miraculous things. But that person would give you a testimony if you knew them where they would sit there and say, this is what God has done, and he's blessed me. And now, when you talk about knowing, hope, it's not the answer to a test. This person has hope. God is with them and for them. And it's not easy, and there's sacrifice, and there's obedience, and you gotta, you got to go all in. But brothers and sisters... If we want to have a hope that will sustain us in all of the darkness and all of the difficulties, we've got to go all in because he's gone all in for us. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give thanks and praise for who you are and what you've done and the hope that we have and the testimony of resurrection and the reality that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work within us and you want to give us this life and you want us to live a new way of living where you now truly are Lord of all. And so wherever we are, I pray that the mighty power that is at work within us would inspire our hearts and minds to begin to live out of the conviction that we know our future in Jesus Christ. We know what you have promised, and we're going to now live to that future. Help us so that we might not only know this hope, but we might feel your power, and you might even work in us in such a way that other people might come and be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>